Carl Benz patented his automobile in 1886. And since then, countless companies have thrown their hats in the ring. They've come from building them by hand in sheds to cranking them out by the millions annually. The companies that build them are among the largest in the world. It's a multi-billion dollar industry today. But have you ever wondered what automakers did before cars were invented? Opel is one of the most prominent nameplates across Europe. But before getting into cars, the German automaker was established in two very different industries. Founder Adam Opel was born in Rüsselsheim, Germany in 1837. He followed in his father's footsteps and trained as a locksmith. This led him to a short stint as a traveling metal worker. While this wasn't the most stable line of work to be in, he gained valuable experience and became skilled enough to start a business of his own in 1862, where he built sewing machines. Adam lived in Paris for a time and was taken by a unit at the Paris Exhibition. He knew that sewing machines would completely revolutionize the textile industry. It was the next big thing, and it was imperative that he established himself in the market before it became oversaturated. He moved back to Germany and got into business with his little brother. His uncle was also a believer. He let them work out of a spare cow stall of his while they got things off the ground. They wouldn't be able to devote much of their time to the venture initially. Their father wanted them to take over the locksmithing business so that he could finally retire. So they worked during the day and devoted all of their spare time to developing the sewing machine. Adam spent weeks on his first model, which was completed in the beginning of 1862. They were quality products. The person that bought this one wouldn't need to replace it for another 40 years. Even still, the company struggled to find any consistent success. The sewing machine boom hadn't yet made its way to Germany. It wasn't until the Austro-Prussian War broke out in 1866 that business would pick up. The armies needed thousands of uniforms for their soldiers and turned to the Opel Sewing Machine Company for assistance. During another trip to Paris, he caught wind of another budding craze, bicycles. He bought his five sons their own for the Christmas of 1885 and imported parts from England so that he could build his own. His enthusiasm just as quickly vanished. He took the penny farthing out for a spin after putting it together and wound up face first in a ditch. Adam grew a seething hatred for them. He began referring to the bicycles as bone breakers. He got rid of his, obviously, but he even went as far as to sell the ones that he gave to his sons. The bicycle craze was in full swing at this point. He made a healthy margin on the transaction and figured that getting into the bicycle industry would be a worthwhile business venture. Their first bike left the factory in the spring of 1886, and like the sewing machines before them, things took off from there. Penny farthings were their bread and butter, but low wheel and three wheel variants were added later on. Opel produced both bikes and sewing machines for a time, but a fire in 1911 spelled the end for the latter. Bike production expanded in its place, and by 1923, the company was the largest bicycle manufacturer on the planet. Their war of attrition on the marketplace mirrored the one that Henry Ford was raging across the Atlantic. They implemented an assembly line sometime in the mid-1920s and turned one bike out every second. Nearly 15,000 shops across the world were selling bikes emblazoned with the Opel name. They were also a mainstay in the competitive world. They maintained their own in-house racing team and decorated riders like three-time Tour de France champion Philippe Trien depended on them when it mattered the most. They had a stranglehold on the markets for decades, but they shifted gears yet again to another venture, automobiles. Adam Opel passed away in 1895 and control of the company went to his wife and two oldest sons. In 1899, they brokered a deal with Friedrich Lutzmann, a prominent carriage builder. 
he had a car in the works and wanted to know if Opel would be interested in assisting with production. The partnership was short-lived. Just 65 cars were built and the whole thing was dissolved in 1902. Before the deal went south, Opel also collaborated with Automobile Dacrac in France to build cars under the Opel Dacrac name. A prototype was shown in 1902 and saw production five years later. Opel backed out of this arrangement in 1908. They didn't view these as failed partnerships. They used what they learned to develop a car of their own design, the 48 PS. Their automotive operation took precedence and they eventually sold off their bicycle division to NSU in 1937. James Alexander Holden was the son of a saddler and hardware merchant. Both of his parents passed away by the time he turned 16, and the family business was written to his stepmother and his older brother. Instead of working for them, he went off on his own. He settled in Adelaide after spending a few years in America. He went into business with his brother Edwin, importing various iron tools. Nearby Victoria was in the middle of a gold rush around this time, and Holden's products were in high demand. He used this success to start a new company in 1856, J.A. Holden & Co. He followed in his late father's footsteps by becoming a saddle maker, and business boomed in the age of the horse-drawn carriage. Holden hit a rough patch a few decades later, and James brought on a few partners in an effort to shore up their financial health. His son Henry joined in 1879, and fellow saddle maker H.A. Frost came aboard in 1884. But by this point, he was way in over his head. His debts piled up, and he was forced to sell off the retail and wholesale portions of the company to the others in order to sate creditors. His life spiraled out of control from here. He was declared insolvent in 1885, developed an alcohol addiction, and died of tuberculosis two years later. Henry's son Edward joined the restructured company in 1905 after attending the University of Adelaide. He had a strong interest in cars and wanted the business to get out of leatherworking and into automobiles. They eventually did, but they weren't the main focus initially. They did a little car repair and interior upholstery in a shed behind their headquarters. Later on, they also began making motorcycle sidecars. A trimming section was added in 1910, and they built their very first car body four years later. Trade restrictions enacted in 1917 dictated their next steps. Basically, Australia set a limit on the number of cars that could be imported into the country. It was intended to strengthen their own manufacturers, but overseas automakers found a loophole. The rule only applied to completed cars. If they shipped the running gear down under and had a local company apply the bodywork, then they'd be exempt from the regulation. Holden joined the fray in 1918 when they established their own bodybuilding division, Holden Motor Bodybuilders Limited. Work was in no short supply. 587 bodies were constructed in 1919 and by 1923, over 12,000 had been built. They did work for a number of companies, including Ford and Chevrolet. In fact, they were the sole builder of GM's Australian market cars. In 1924, they built over 22,000 bodies, and over half of them were for General Motors. Production fell from an all-time high of 36,000 in 1926, to a mere 1600 in 1931. Their value tanked as a result of the Great Depression, and GM was able to scoop them up for pennies on the dollar. Before its untimely demise in 1966, the Studebaker Corporation was by far the longest tenured automobile nameplate around. They were founded in 1852, but wouldn't build their first car for another 50 years. So what exactly were they doing to pass the time? Their legacy was forged in fire.
in both the figurative and literal sense. John Studebaker was a skilled hand at the forge. He was so skilled, in fact, that he was able to start his own workshop sometime in the late 1830s. Business took off, though the early success probably had to do with the screaming deals more than anything else. For as gifted a blacksmith as he was, John was an equally inept businessman. He was charitable to a fault, handing out credit to those who either couldn't afford his services or simply had no intention of paying him back. His goodwill made him popular with the locals, but it didn't bode well for the business. He was drowning in red ink and was forced to sell the whole thing off. John desperately wanted to leave that part of his life behind, partly because of the bad memories, but mostly because of the debt collectors. He loaded his family into their custom wagon and skipped town. They bought a farm in Ashland, Ohio and tried to settle down. The creditors were hell-bent on getting their money and made the trip along with them. With no other options, John had to mortgage the farm they'd just purchased to get rid of them once and for all. They moved further west to South Bend. Here, his sons Henry and Clement started a wagon shop of their own named H&C Studebaker. But things didn't get off to a great start. The Panic of 1857 left them in a similar shape to their father's old shop all of those years ago. Maybe they weren't cut out for business after all. They would have had to close up shop for good, if not for their younger brother. J.M. Studebaker was set to join his brothers in the company, but he dropped out at the last minute to head west in hopes of striking it rich in the gold rush. He did strike it rich, but not by panning for gold. Upon arriving in California, he found that there was a great demand for wheelbarrows. He began building them on his own to satisfy said demand, and in a few short years had managed to save about $8,000. He moved back to South Bend and injected the spiraling business with cash. In 1866, the brothers established a new firm called the Studebaker Brothers Manufacturing Company. Military contracts and westward expansion caused them to grow from a respected wagon builder to one of the most prominent in the industry. They were devastated by fires in 1872 and 1874, but Studebaker came back stronger each time. In 1891, a lawyer by the name of Fred Fish married into the family and suggested the brothers get into horseless carriages. They agreed to do so, though they didn't put all of their chips into them. At the turn of the century, cars were seen as a novelty for the rich. If it was just a fad, then the company didn't want to be left out to dry. They began producing electric vehicles in 1902 alongside their wagons. They also marketed gasoline-powered cars built by the EMF Company of Detroit and the Gafford Company of Illyria, Ohio. They doubled down on cars in 1911 when they bought EMF outright and rolled that production into their own operation. Fred Fish really took the company to the next level. Sales soared from $3.6 million in 1901 to $43.4 million in 1914. In 1915, Fish was succeeded by Albert Russell Erskine. He dropped the wagons and turned their focus entirely onto cars. Business surged throughout the 1920s, and then the Great Depression happened, and Studebaker would never see sustained success ever again. The final company we'll be taking a look at today is Peugeot. Its founder Jean-Pierre was born in 1734, and like a few others we talked about, he had quite the business acumen. He established several companies, including a weaving business, a dye works, an oil mill, and a grain mill. His children followed his lead. His two youngest sons got into the textile industry, while the two oldest, Jean-Pierre II and jean Frédéric, went into business with a son-in-law. Together, they officially founded Peugeot in 1810. 
they transformed the family grain mill into a full-on steel foundry. The company produced everything from saws to coffee grinders and even umbrella frames. Jean-Pierre II's two sons, Jules and Emile, bought out the other partners and used their newfound control to establish another company in 1851. Production stepped up drastically. They renovated their two existing factories and opened two others. Jean-Pierre set the foundation. His sons expanded into metalworking, and his grandsons outright doubled their production facilities. The table was set for his great-grandsons to take the company to heights previously unimagined. This next part might sound familiar. Jules' son Armand graduated from college and then went to England to observe their bicycle industry. He was blown away by what he saw, and when he returned to France, he urged his family to build bikes of their own. By 1882, they were producing models that were heavily inspired by the ones he saw on his trip. This was only a few years before the birth of the automobile. He became fascinated with them and was further assured of their viability after meeting with several industry pioneers, including Gottlieb Daimler. It began as a mere diversion he collaborated with engineer Leon Serpollet on a steam-powered tricycle that debuted at the 1889 World's Fair in Paris. It didn't make an impression. Only four examples were built in total. He scrapped steam power and turned his attention to gasoline engines. His next project, the Type 2, suffered an eerily similar fate to its predecessor. Only four of these were produced as well. He kept refining the formula until 1891, when he created the Type 3. This was the first Peugeot that was sold to the public. Relatively speaking, it did very well. 64 units were made in its three years of production. He wanted to capitalize on this, but not everyone shared his enthusiasm. There were others in the company that didn't want to risk the family fortune on what they considered a novelty. With practically no support from his family, he left the company and established a firm of his own. It would be dedicated to building gasoline-powered cars. Creating a company that solely produced automobiles was unheard of back then. Producing them at any meaningful scale in the days before the assembly line was something that eluded many manufacturers. But instead of focusing on the numbers, Armand wanted to start slowly and gradually work into a rhythm. In its first year of operation, the factory produced just one car a week. The following year, they were doing three a week. And the year after that, they ramped up to ten cars a week. His risk paid off, but a series of failed side projects and the death of his only son and the sole heir to the company meant that he was forced to merge his business back with the family business in 1910. He only stayed for a few more years before stepping down. Before he passed away in 1915, he saw his automotive operation go from a series of curious experiments to the largest manufacturer in France with a 20% share of the market. And that'll wrap things up here. If there were any other companies that fit the criteria that I missed, then drop them in the comments section. If there's enough of them, then I'll consider making a part 2. If you enjoyed this video, then consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching.